We've come to hear what the Lord has to say to us. We've come to hear what God has to say to you as an individual this morning. So come on as you stand there. Come on, pray. Pray in the spirit there right now. God is spirit. And the true worshipers worship Him in spirit and in truth. Come on, right there where you stand. God can touch you right there where you are. God can speak to you right there where you are this morning. Come on, just worship Him. Just take a moment. Worship Him this morning. Worship Him. Worship Him. He wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal to you what only He can reveal to you. He wants to share with you what only He can share with you this morning. Come on. In His presence. It's in His presence where there's fullness of joy. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. It's the anointing that removes the burden. Come on, as you stand in His presence. Just give to God what you need to give to God this morning. Give to God what you need to give to Him this morning. It's in His presence that you are delivered. It's in His presence that you are healed. It's in His presence that you are set free. There the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's liberty. So, Father, as we stand in your presence this morning, Lord, I pray that you come as only you can. I pray, Lord, Father God, that in your presence there's fullness of joy, Father. And I pray that this morning, Father, as we stand here this morning, Father, that you will restore unto us the joy of our salvation, Father. I pray, Lord, Father God, that we will return to our first love in Jesus, that you will be the center of it all this morning, Father. I pray, Lord, Father God, that you can come, that you can heal your people. Speak to your people, touch your people, Father. Restore your people, Father. Revive your people, Father. Father, as we stood this morning and we sang, Father, we said, we are desperate for you, Father. We said, we declared that we believe that you can do it this morning, Father. So we pray that you will do it, Lord. As we stand in your presence, Father, we pray that you do it, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Refresh us. Open up our eyes, Father. Quicken in us, Father. Tired bodies, Lord. Give us ears to hear, Father. Give us hearts to respond, Lord, to your presence this morning, Father. We thank you, Lord. We stand with our hands lifted high. As we raise you in worship, Father, we say that you are worthy. That you alone, Father, are to be worshipped in this place. So we rise above in our circumstance. We rise above in our limitations, Father, and we lift you up knowing that when we lift you up, that you lift us out of where we find ourselves, Lord. We give you glory this morning, Father. We give you praise in this place. And we lift up your name, Jesus. And if you believe that this morning, come on. Let's give Jesus praise this morning. Come on, CRC Paul. Give him praise this morning. Lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, before you take your seat, welcome your neighbor this morning. Greet someone. Welcome someone. Turn to someone behind you, in front of you. Amen. Welcome someone to the house of God. Amen. Sean, just bring my Bible there. Amen. Amen. Let's get the lights right. Amen. Just the lights there at the back. Amen. Awesome. Trailer swar in the hutte. Okay. You live in Paul, so that's just a given. It's going to be hot. Amen. It's like hell. It's going to be hot. Amen. So if you're struggling now, just make sure you don't end up in hell because you're going to have a tough time then. Amen. Amen. This is not a dry of dry service. Amen. But. Uh, sometimes so in the flesh that it determines where we are and we live by faith amen not live by circumstance or by our flesh we live by faith amen amen right you ready for the word the title of my message this morning is what is that in your hand come on turn to your neighbor ask him what is that in your hand ask your husband ask your wife what is that in your hand 
Hopefully it's a Bible, not your cell phone. Amen. But I was, I was thinking this week, meditating upon the Word of God, that the scripture that came to me, and I believe that's what God's asking us as the church, that's what He's asking us as people, and that's what He's asking us as Christians. What is that in your hand? And we're all pretty well acquainted with the life and the story of Moses. And he is mentioned in most Christian leadership books. If you've ever read a Christian leadership book, the name of Moses would appear in that book somewhere. He's known as a deliverer, a leader, a man of God who oversaw and carried out some of the most epic exploits. So when we think of Moses, we think of this amazing man who led the nation of Israel over the sea that parted as he raised his staff. And we see him deliver millions of people. And we have these thoughts and this mindset about who this person of Moses is and who he was. But Moses, Moses, however, did not have a great start in life. Born into slavery. He was sentenced to die as a baby. He was given up by his mother. He was raised by the Egyptians, a people different to him. He was seen as an imposter and an outcast by his own people. Moses never really fit in and didn't seem to fit the mold of what we would call a gifted or natural leader. or Someone that we would associate with greatness. If you looked at the start that Moses had in life, seemingly for a season it seemed okay. Because he grew up in the palace, was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses didn't have a great beginning. And as we'll see, his life at some stage took a turn. And it seemed that like every prospect that Moses would have, would have had, if it would have been given growing up in the palace of Pharaoh, was taken away from him. And in his life, it hit a dead end. And yet Moses was used mightily by God. The clue was always in his name which meant to lift out. Exodus 4 verse 2, our scripture verse this morning says, And so the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. Pick up Moses' story after God spoke to him from the burning bush while he was tending his father-in-law's sheep in the desert. And we remember the story. You can read Exodus in your own time. Moses was raised in the palace of Pharaoh. And one day he came upon an Egyptian that was beating a Jewish man. And he beat the man. And Moses took the Egyptian and he killed him. And then the very next day, he goes back into the working field. And he sees two Jewish men arguing and enter into a fight. And he's trying to stop the fight. And they turn to him and they say, but who are you to talk to us about fighting? And we saw that you killed that Egyptian. And so Moses fled for his life at the age of 40 into the wilderness where he met Jethro's daughter who was to become his wife. And there Moses was called of God, this great leader with a great future, shepherding sheep at the age of 40. pretty sure Moses resigned himself to the fact that he would be a sheep herder for the rest of his life, raise his family and live a quiet existence away from the world he used to know so well. I'm pretty sure at the age of 40, he thought, well, this is my life right now. This is what I've been called to, wandering the desert, looking after another man's sheep. This is my life. Then God enters the picture. And at the age of 80, after wandering the wilderness and the desert with sheep for 40 years, at the age of 80, God enters the picture. And everything about Moses and the life he knew is about to change. Just that alone is a word for some of us. So 
Some of you think in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, that you've most likely reached the peak of your life. But here God comes to Moses at the age of 80 and he says, I've got an assignment for you. I don't think we have any 80-year-olds here. Do we have any 80-year-olds? Can I see? Do I show hands? Some of you might feel 80. But at the age of 80, God interrupts Moses. Out there in the wilderness, tending sheep. He speaks to him from a burning bush. Now one would think that if the God of all creation appeared to you in a burning bush and hands you assignment to do on his behalf, that most people would jump at the opportunity to be used personally by God. Isn't that so? If you had to leave this place and suddenly stand at a stop sheet or a robot and this tree starts talking to you and says, I am God, I've got this assignment for you. If you'd think that you'd take the assignment, isn't it? As it is so it is. But not Moses, however. Now before you cast judgment on old Mo, his story, however, represents most of our stories of stepping into the things that God has called us to and the things that God has prepared for us. So whenever you read a story in the Bible or whenever you read about a character in the Bible, just turn my mic down a little bit, I'm getting some feedback. Whenever you read a story, you have to ask yourself, Lord, what are you trying to tell me through this person and through this story? And then you have to see yourself in the character of that story. So before you cast judgment on Moses, who was spoken to by a burning bush, you have to ask, Lord, what are you trying to say to me in this story? Because we have the Holy Spirit with us, living in us and speaking to us constantly. And I dare to say that some of us here are like Moses. who's rebutting God's argument and saying, Lord, you must have the wrong pe person here. I don't think you've got the right person. Look what Moses does in Exodus 4 verse 13. Now see yourself. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Ever felt like that? Ever thought that? Ever said that? Lord, please Use anyone else but me. And prior to this verse, there's a back and forth discussion between God and Moses. As God's trying to convince Moses to step up to the call. And Moses saying, but he's not the right person. He can't do it. He's not able. And he questions God's wisdom in choosing him for this assignment. All throughout the burning bush experience and discussion, Moses is questioning God on his choice of deliverer. Until Moses finally says what he says in Exodus verse 14. Can't you use anyone else, Lord, but me? I don't feel equipped. I don't believe I can do this. I don't come from the right family. I don't have the right background. I don't have the right education. I don't have enough money. I cannot do this. Starting to see yourself? Amen. I saw myself as I read that. Lord, why me? I'm not able to. I don't have what it takes. Choose someone else. I don't want to do this. Isn't there any other way? And there's a Moses story in all of us. clue to how God was going to use Moses was in the question God asks Moses in verse 2. He's asking Moses, what is that in your hand? 
Now it seems a silly question, a quite an obvious question for the God who knows everything to ask Moses what is in his hand. Just think as you read your Bible, just think. If you were holding something in your hand, your cell phone or something, and I came to you and I asked you, what is that in your hand? You would think me stupid or silly or foolish to ask what is in your hand when I can see very clear what it is in your hand. So as we read our Bibles, we have to read it and make the pictures and think, but why would God ask him something that's so obvious? Sarcastic me was likely would have responded, Lord, it's a fishing rod, I'm going fishing. Moses has more sense than that. And he says to God, it's a rod. But what God was asking him was a lot more than just what the physical ob object was. God was asking him of what the rod represented. Exodus 4 verse 3, the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Moses' rod represented his livelihood. It represented his identity and it was a symbol of his life. So when God asked him, what is this rod? What is this in your hand? He was trying to get Moses to consider his life. Because that rod represented everything that Moses had been through over the last 40 years in the wilderness, tending sheep. It was a rod that he used to walk with. It was a rod that he used for support. It was a rod that he sometimes made him use as a cane had he been injured. It was a rod that he used to fend off animals. It was a rod that he used to tend the sheep to count. It was a rod that he used to kill snakes. And so that rod represented everything about who Moses was and who he had become over the last 40 years. It represented his life. What God was asking Moses first and foremost when he asked what's in his hand was, who are you, Moses? And so God's asking you this morning, who are you this morning? What do you have in your hand? Amen. And so we see when God asked Moses to throw his rod on the ground, what he was actually asking Moses was for him to lay down his life. Because the rod represented his entire life. And he said, Lord, said Moses, lay it down. Throw it on the ground. And when Moses threw his rod, it immediately turned into a snake. And when it turned into a snake, Moses did what he had been doing for 40 years. Ever since he ran from Egypt and went to go hide in the wilderness, he did what he had been doing for 40 years. And when that rod of his turned into a snake, Moses ran. He ran again. Just like he ran and he fled from Egypt, at this moment when the rod turned into a snake, he ran again. And that's what many of us do. When the challenges come, when the pressure comes, when the call comes, what do we do? We run. And so God sends a foolish man with a floral shirt to come and challenge you. To stop running from the things that God has called you to. Yes, your life is full of challenges, and yes, it might be dangerous to call, but let's follow the story, because in following God's call on our lives and obeying Him, at times it's going to bring us resistance, and it's going to bring us challenges and lead us into places and situations that we would not necessarily seek out and pursue on our own. That's why sometimes things happen to you. Because God needs to shift you and shake you out of your comfort and get you to a place where He can use you. And some of the things you've been thinking, it's the devil. But some of those things God has allowed to get you out of your comfort into a place of purpose so He can use you. 
Amen. And so that rod is a representation of Moses' life and the fact that it turned into a snake and symbolically showed of the challenges that, lay, that lie ahead for Moses in leading his people into deliverance. But it also represented everything that Moses had faced in life that brought him to that place because we associate the snake with danger and with the enemy. Moses was running from the enemy and he was running from danger and God was trying to point, prove a point to Moses. And this is a picture of what we sometimes do when God comes calling. And this is a picture of what we do when the enemy shows up. We shrink back. We don't want to fight. Please, not me, Lord. And this is a picture of most Christians. Maybe a picture of all Christians. It's easier to point a finger at Moses and sit in judgment of his disobedience and stubbornness. But we've all been there. And some of us are still there. Activity doesn't point to purpose. We can all be active. We can all be busy. Moses was busy in the wilderness. He was tending sheep. He was serving his father-in-law's business. But being in business, having a job, raising a family might keep you busy, but that necessarily isn't purpose. And so God comes and shakes his comfort. God in his grace and wisdom also does something that would stretch, but also strengthen Moses. Exodus 4 verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. God tells Moses to do something that seemingly seems foolish and even dangerous. Because the only reason Moses would have fled or ran from the snake is most likely is he had seen snakes like that in the wilderness. He understood that that snake was venomous. He understood something about the snake. And there the Lord says to him, Moses, pick up the snake by its tail. He most likely would have killed snakes with his rod while herding sheep or protecting his family. But now he had no weapon. He had no rod to defend himself against the snake and to kill the snake. And so what God was telling him in that moment, is whatever the enemy intended for evil, God would use for good. And that the snake would not harm him. Even though you don't have a rod, Moses. Moses would have felt helpless and naked without his rod. He had held on to that rod for 40 years of his life. And now the very thing he depended on for his livelihood had become the enemy, had become the snake, and now he can't defend himself. And God says, pick up the snake. And he picks up the snake and it turns into a rod again. And God was showing him that he needed to trust in the Lord. That he needed to heed his voice. Moses on his own would not have picked up the snake. He would have kept on running. I understand that because I have a slight fear of snakes. Amen. Thank you. I'm not the only sissy. I am not going up to the thing with a broom. I'm running from the snake. I'm calling my wife to sort it out. Spiders I can deal with. Snakes. Lord hasn't called me to deal with snakes, amen. So I understand Moses running from the snake. But God says, heed my voice. Do what I say, and it will not harm you. And as he picked up the snake, God was telling Moses that the power did not lie in the rod per se. But his rod became powerful and used for God's purpose when he heeded God's voice. Moses trusted in his rod. 
God said, trust in me. And I will use your life. I will use that rod for my purpose. Amen. You still with me? If you've ever doubted your call or your assignment, you really are in some good company. Amen. You are in illustrious company. You are in some famous company. Most great men and women used by God have had moments of doubt, fear, uncertainty, and failure. If you've never had fear, if you've never had doubt, if you've never had uncertainty, if you've never been through difficulty, I doubt whether you're a Christian. I doubt whether you're living by faith because if you're going to live by faith, you are going to have challenges. In my experience as a Christian, every time I step out of faith is the time that resistance comes. Is the time that the attack comes. So you've got to say praise God when the snake shows up because you know you're on the right road. Amen? Adam, Eve, Abram, Sarah, Jacob, Moses, David, Esther, Paul, Peter, etc. The names and the list goes on and on. They all either had a bad past, made bad choices, made bad mistakes, or didn't seem to be the most obvious candidate for their chosen assignment. God seems to use the most unlikely of people for his greatest assignment. The enemy wasn't prepared for an 80-year-old man hiding in the wilderness. Moses wasn't this big, buff, muscular, physical, dynamic leader. Most likely the enemy was looking for that. And God went to go look for an 80-year-old man in the wilderness. Still with me. And that's why you can never say, Lord, you must have the wrong person. Lord, it cannot be me. God will use the unlikely person. But it's time to come out of the wilderness. It's time to come out of hiding. Even Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus, had moments of fear and doubt. For the first time this week, I saw this. Never saw it before. I always thought that Jesus prayed this prayer once. And as I read through the scripture, Jesus prayed the same prayer three times. From verse 38, he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. To explain the context of that scripture, the stress and the anguish that Jesus is feeling at that point makes him feel like he wants to die. That is the amount of stress that Jesus is experiencing. So be very careful when you use the word stress. Jesus is at the point that he feels he cannot take this anymore. This is too much to handle. The stress is so much that he feels like he's going to die. Maybe you've experienced that kind of stress to a degree that the pressure that the situation is too much to bear, that it feels like your heart's racing in your chest, you're getting palpitations, there's fear that's gripping you and you just want to flee. Yet the fight or flight syndrome, they call it. And so this is what Jesus is experiencing. And he says to his disciples, stay here, keep watch with me. And he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will be to be done, not mine. First time. Then he returned to his disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me for even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cap cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, but they couldn't keep their eyes open. And so he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Jesus, three times, goes to his father and says, Lord, if at all possible, is there no other way that we can save the human race? Three times 
he goes and prays. And that's a picture sometimes of the loneliness that we experience in the seasons that we find ourselves. Because when Jesus returns to the disciples, they're not there praying with him. And he's alone in the garden, not physically, but in support, he's alone. And sometimes we feel alone. And sometimes we're asking, Lord, is there no other way? And there Jesus is in the garden, praying to his Father and saying, Lord, is there no other way that we can do this? The stress to the point of death. Now this message in no way is to make light of the things that you're facing and the challenges that are ahead of you. Because I know some of you are facing some tough calls. You need to make some hard decisions in order to obey God. But take courage. Whatever you're facing, Jesus faced first. And because Jesus overcome, you can overcome. No challenge, no situation that you're facing is too big for you to go through. You just have to get to the point where you obey God and say, Lord, I'll do this. It's okay to pray the prayer, Lord. Can't you send someone else? I don't feel like the right person. Jesus was wise enough to say, Lord, but yet your will be done. And when you read the Exodus account, on his way to Egypt, God was make, getting ready to kill Moses. It says so in the Bible. Because Moses most likely must have complained from the time he started walking until the time he got into the place where he needed to be. And God said, I'm fed up. I'm just going to take you out. Now, God's not going to take anyone out here this morning. Amen. We're in the dispensation of grace. So I'm stirring your faith. So you're not as bad as you think, because most likely Moses was complaining and arguing with God the whole time on his way to Egypt. So whatever you're facing, Jesus already paid the price. That's why you can face it. That's why you are well able to do it. God has not made a mistake by choosing you. And God has not made a mistake by bringing you to this place to hear this message. You're here for a reason. Now I'm going to put a heavy on you. People's breakthroughs are waiting on the other side of your obedience. People are depending on you to obey God so that they can receive their breakthrough. So that they can receive their deliverance. So that they can receive their healing. So that they can receive their salvation. People are waiting on the other side of you responding to the call of God and saying, Yes, Lord, here I am. Send me. I will go. People are waiting on the other side of your obedience. People's destinies are attached to you, overcoming your fears and doing what God has called you to do. People's deliverance is depending on your assignment. So you can't waver too long and you can't fight too long. Because on the other side of your obedience, someone will receive their deliverance. Someone will receive their breakthrough. Someone will receive their blessing. Exodus 4.20, then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey. Picture of Jesus. Moses is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And he returned to the land of Egypt. And here's the change. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And Moses decided finally, I'm going to put my life in the hands of God. I'm going to lay my life down. When Moses made that decision, it wasn't the rod of Moses anymore. It became the rod of God. A distinct difference. Moses made up his mind, something changed. The rod in his hand was no longer just a shepherd's staff. 
It was the rod of God used for God's purpose. But now God's power could move in and through Moses' life. And the rod became a symbol of God's power. And when you make the decision to lay down your life for God's cause, your life becomes a powerful tool in the hands of God. That's why the Bible says when you hold on to your life, you will lose it. But when you lose your life, you will find it. Because when you give your life to God, when you lose your life for the cause of Jesus Christ, your life becomes a powerful tool in the hands of God. And God can use you mightily in ways that you never thought possible. You have to put yourself in his hands. That rod represented Moses' whole life. It was his support. It was his weapon. It was his protection. It was his livelihood. It represented his authority. But that rod represented so much more. And I know some of us are battling with our assignments battling with the calls, and as I'm preaching here this morning, you're slightly irritated with me because God's reminding you of things He told you to do. Now you're thinking about them again, hoping that they are in the past and God had forgotten, but God, if He has to wait another 40 years like He waited for Moses, He will wait. So don't wait till you're 80. Do most of what you need to do for God right now, and enjoy your retirement. And I had a similar walk more than once as a Christian. When God spoke to me about coming to plant CRC Paul, I ignored God for two weeks because I thought he had the wrong person. And I said nothing to no one. But God clearly spoke to me in an evening service while Pastor Art was preaching. And I ignored it and I went home and I went about my week. Said nothing to my wife, said nothing to my friends, said nothing to Pastor Aiden, said nothing to no one. So the next week God speaks again. This time he speaks a little bit more clearly, gives me a scripture. Then again I ignore God, say nothing to my wife, say nothing to my pastor. Say nothing to no one. Because Lord, you must have the wrong person. I know my assignment. I'm here in Cape Town. I have a district that I'm looking after. I have a few ministries that I'm looking after. I am not called to lead a church. I am not able. I am not equipped. I don't have what it takes. That was the conversation that was going on in my heart. And that is what I was saying to God. And I had a problem with the blood of love. My flesh wanted to be in the city. I didn't want to be in Palm. Didn't want to be here. Had no reason to be here. Didn't care for the great schools here. Didn't care for the river and the valley and the mountains. And I didn't care for anything. I wanted to be in the city. And I thought God had the wrong person. Because my heart was where I was. And as you can see, I obeyed God. And I'm here. And I love Paul, and I love all of you. You are amazing people, amen? But when a Jewish man is given a rod, it's not just a stick or a branch that is randomly picked. It's carefully selected, crafted, and treated so that staff would last a lifetime. It's carefully selected. And that staff represented Moses' life. And God's saying to you that you are carefully selected and prepared for the assignment that he has for you. But it was, also, it was also customary for those shepherds to engrave significant life events into the staff that they no doubt would look at and reflect on from time to time, reminding on them of where they'd been, what they have been through. That staff, as the shepherd would use it, they would carve out dates and significant events of what happened to them. So over 40 years, I could just imagine what Moses had carved into that staff. 
all his heartache and his hurt and his pain, his victories, his successes, everything that he had amassed and done. And he would have looked at that staff and his mind would have cast it back to certain events and certain things that would have happened. So it's safe then to conclude that some of those events most likely would have included disappointments and tragedies and failures along with the accomplishments and victories and celebrations, most like our lives. Amidst the victories and the accomplishments and the successes, there's heartache and hurt and failures and disappointment. What God was saying to Moses when he said, throw down the rod, was it doesn't matter what you had been through. Doesn't matter where you'd been, doesn't matter what you had done. That your past does not disqualify you from being used by God. Because Moses might have looked at that staff and realized that I'm not qualified for God, what God's calling me to. I have a past. I have made mistakes. I have done wrong things. I'm not qualified to be used of God. And some of you are thinking exactly that. I've made mistakes. I've said and done some things that I'm ashamed of. I'm not qualified. And God's saying to you, like He's saying to Moses, when you lay down your life, your mistakes and your past and your failures and everything that you have done wrong will not come and bite you like a snake. Because there was every chance that that snake could have bitten Moses. And God was saying to Moses, your past cannot hurt you. What you've done wrong cannot hurt you. It is over. It is settled. It is done. You are forgiven. And so God's saying the same to you. God did not make a mistake in using you. And have you made mistakes? I'm pretty sure you've made some pretty bad mistakes. Have you done some things that you're not proud of? I'm pretty sure you've done some really bad things, like most of us. Then my natural ability, based upon my past, I'm not qualified to stand here with this mic and preach the gospel to you, but I responded to the call of God, and God is able to use me. God is able to use you, but you need to get over the things that are withholding you limiting you from stepping into the things that God has for you. When God told Moses to pick up the snake by its tail, I'm sure he hesitated for a moment, thinking this was dangerous, and that the snake could bite him. God was showing Moses that all the things he believed disqualified him to be used by God. The hurts, the failures, the insecurities, the rejection, and the fears were the very things God used to shape him. And that his past failures would not come to harm him, but that God will use it for his glory. That was Moses' testimony. That everything that you've been through in life, every heartache, every hurt, every failure, every mistake, every rejection, everything that you've experienced in this life, God has allowed and God has used to shape and mold you for this very moment. To lead your family to lead your future, to lead others into the promised land. God has been shaping you all this time. And it's time you wake up to your call and to your purpose and say, Lord, I will do it. All throughout the life of Moses, his rod became a symbol of strength, deliverance, authority, and power as he was yielded to the call of God, leading the people into their promised land. Just go read your Bible and see how at every significant moment the rod of God was involved. The rod of Moses was involved. Every significant moment throughout their journey from Egypt, 
over the Dead Sea. Every moment that rod was there. Represented Moses' life. What you've been through, what you've done, serves a purpose. The Bible is full of people that are the most unlikely people that God used them. And as you're sitting there this morning, you might seem like the most unlikely person to be used. But you are exactly who God is going to use. Finally, in closing, Romans 8, 37, even though Jesus had his moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though he doubted, and even though he had fear, and even though he had stress, and even though he didn't want to go through what he went through, it says this of Jesus, that no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Because Jesus saw through what he saw through. And because Jesus, even though he was fearful and even though he knew the pain that lay ahead and even though he knew what he had to go through, he went through it. And that's why Romans 8, 37 says, overwhelming victory is ours. You might not feel qualified for that very thing that you know God is speaking to you about right now. But the Bible says overwhelming victory is yours. You and God together make a majority. But you have to come to the point and get over yourself and trust and believe God that He has not made a mistake, that He's chosen the right person, and then step into everything that God has called you to. And some of you are thinking many things. Let me just make this clear. That when God used people, He added to their life which seemed like burdens. Because all these men and all these women, they had people that were dependent on them. They had families and careers and businesses. And here God puts another thing in my life. And what I have found, most Christians sometimes, is that they want to put things down. God's called me to a season of rest, and God's called me to a season of hearing His voice. If God calls you, He puts more upon you. So don't even say that God's calling you to a season of rest. Now you say, no, I'm going to stop serving, and I'm going to stop being a leader going to stop doing this and stop doing that. God puts additional things into the hands of people that He calls. And the burden sometimes seems too much. I know. I've been through that more than once in my life. And when God calls you into something, your immediate response most likely would be, I cannot do this. And if that's your response, then that's exactly what God wants you to do. Amen. Send me the summit, man. I never felt qualified to do what I'm doing. But I obeyed God nonetheless. And I've made some very terrible mistakes. Ask my wife. But here I am. And there have been times that I've wanted to give up. Say, Lord, send someone else to lead this church. Because the scripture in Ezekiel 3 that Lord, the Lord gave me before I came to Paul is so very true. I am experiencing that every day since the day I set my foot in this place. Because in Ezekiel 3, the Lord said, I'm sending you to a stubborn, stiff-necked people. Not you sitting here, but those unsaved heathens out there riding their bikes and 
sitting on the wine farms and drinking coffee this morning while we're hearing the gospel. That has been my experience. And I said, Lord, I don't want this. But every time I have to do, I have to realize I'm called by God. And that because Jesus had victory, I am victorious. And because Jesus gives you the victory, you will be victorious in everything that God has called you to. Because Jesus overcame sin and death, we are able to overcome and be victorious in the things that God has prepared for us. You are well able. You are the right person. God did not make a mistake. You are well able. You are qualified. You are in the right place at the right time for the season that God has you in. It might seem strange. It might seem uncomfortable. It might seem difficult even. But you're in the right place at the right time. Just respond to the call. Do what God says. Because then the other side of your obedience is deliverance, breakthrough, victory, and blessing. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning as we close up this service. Come on, every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around at this moment. Just you and God this morning. Come on, God's speaking to some people here this morning. Just you and God. 